Um, so thank you all for joining. We're super excited to have everyone. Um, we're, um, thank you all for joining us on our very first live stream of Coffee and Conversations with ECE. I'm happy to introduce our first faculty guest, Professor Ian Hiskins. Ian Hiskins, the Venema Professor of Engineering, is a renowned expert in power systems dynamics with a special focus on renewable energy and the grid. He has made fundamental contributions to the study of power systems dynamics. Much of his research in recent years has focused on improving integration of renewable energy into the grid. Professor Hiskins earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and mathematics from the California Institute of Advanced um, Education and his PhD from the University of Newcastle, Australia. He spent more than a decade with the Queensland in Electricity Commission, where he has held the position of EMS Security Applications Engineer and Planning Engineer Transmission Systems before returning to academia. And now here's Professor Hiskins. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Sylvia. I appreciate the, the intro. Um, so this is the first of these things. So I've never actually seen what anyone does because apparently I'm first at doing this. So that was not how I intended it at all. Um, the idea is that uh, you'll get to know a little bit more about faculty, like who are they really and what gets them excited and things like that. So the first thing I'll mention is that I am a classic introvert who um, has actually really enjoyed the whole social isolation thing because I get to stay home and work on interesting research. Um, so they, there you have it. I'm not, not sure how a, an introvert ended up being first on this thing, but anyway, that's the, the, the joy of how it works. Um, okay, so a little bit about me, and then there's some questions that I'll come back to, and then I'm sure people will have questions uh, uh, as we go along as well. Um, and yeah, just, Keep in mind, this is not something I normally do. So, um, so, so we'll, we'll see how it works out. Okay, so a little bit about me. You can probably tell from my accent, it's not classic Midwest. So I uh, grew up in Australia um, and uh, still go back there frequently or as frequently as the aeroplanes allow at the moment. Um, what else? So we moved to the US in 1999 um, to take faculty position and uh, have been here ever since. So normally we spend the northern summers like this period of time, mostly in Australia or at conferences. So actually being in Ann Arbor for summer is a, a new experience. Um, and a very enjoyable one, actually, as well. The summers are, are really quite pleasant here. Okay, so that's that's a little bit of me. That's you know, where do I come from? I come from Australia, um, and uh, enjoy going back there. Um, we have five kids. Uh, four of the kids are living in Australia. They have all at various times proceeded to move back to Australia. And then one of our kids is uh, in, living in Ann Arbor, well, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Celine kind of area, so living close by. Uh, what else? So our, our kids, um, you know, I'm obviously an engineer, and of course you would like for everyone to be engineers because what else is there to do in life? Um, well, that's not exactly how the family worked out. So. Our oldest son is just finishing PhD, uh, looking at um, concussion-induced Alzheimer's, actually. So, um, and seeking to understand some of the mechanisms associated with that process. So, much way on the biological side of things, uses all these big words to describe various different aspects of what he's working on. So being a mere engineer, that's a little challenging. Um, anyway, so that's our oldest son. They have two kids, uh, two grandkids, uh, his wife, uh, who's 
who's trained in um, sports physiology actually spends her a lot of her life looking after the kids. So our, our second child, our daughter Melinda, is uh, works in an art museum. She's art historian. So I'm not sure where that came from. And her husband has a PhD in health economics. So we're spanning biology through art to economics. Our third child daughter is a, a um, interior designer, uh, architect type person. So again, there's some uh, creativity there that uh, didn't come from me. And her husband runs a sports program for small children. Um, so our, our family is what you would call somewhat diverse. Our fourth child uh, is an engineer, an electrical engineer, actually did his electrical engineering at Michigan, actually took a one, one or two classes from me. So that was an interesting experience. We would uh, race each other out the door on our bicycles across the campus to see who could get to class first on uh, Tuesday and Thursday mornings. So he's an electrical engineer. Uh, he uh, um, works for an automotive company around the place uh, and enjoys signal processing type stuff. Then our fifth child is trained in early childhood and elementary education, but is, uh, is employed as working as a chaplain in the school system in Australia at the moment. So that's the roundup. As you can probably imagine, my wife has uh, kept busy looking after family, supporting me, supporting my activities, the research activities and all that goes with being faculty. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of family aspects of, uh, of life. And I, I will mention an important part of who I am is uh, I'm a Christian. We worship at a local church close by here, though for the last four months, that's all been online, as you would imagine. As I mentioned earlier, we normally fly off to Australia at this time of the year, but there's uh, very few aeroplanes flying to Australia at the moment. And once you arrive there, um, you sit in a hotel room for 14 days and maybe bring food along and slip it under the door, apparently, and it's not very tasty. So we um, have not uh, tried to make it back to Australia for the summer. So we might try and make it back for Christmas. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so what else? Um, we um, have, a, I, I pulled up a couple of photos. So now let's see if I can share the screen. And just to kind of paint a bit of a picture of the sorts of things that, that I do. So I'm gonna share the screen before I do that. Now I've lost the share the screen window. Um, okay, too much technology here, but we will get there. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Sylvia, can you see that? Yes, we can. It looks beautiful. Yeah, okay. So, so we have a uh, house in Australia um, that we go back to when we visit there, though we don't get there very often. And so this is the view out of the window of our house in Australia. Um, so it's a little bit different to a Michigan view. It um, is really quite pleasant being there. So this house has actually been in the family since the 1930s. It was my grandparents, and my parents, and passed down to myself and my siblings. And it's interesting, our kids have been there, our grandkids have been there. So five generations have visited this place. But this is, when it's snowing outside in Ann Arbor in the middle of winter, this is kind of motivation for keeping me going and alive and dealing with life. This is what the viewers 
that I dream about and we will go back to in retirement. Let's see. This is also from our front, from the, the window of our house in Australia. Um, this was actually taken just after a cyclone. So you guys call them hurricanes, um, but uh, in Australia they're called cyclones, but they have the same effect, except they spin in the opposite direction and they bring in 200 kilometer hour winds uh, straight off the, off the ocean and um, into our house. But it, uh, it's so old that it, it's actually really strong. And so in the cyclone, they, pretty much all the neighbors' houses had their roofs removed and walls removed and things like that. We had a few trees removed, as you can kind of see in the front there. But the house just stood there and nothing knocks it over. So that was really uh, helpful. But um, again, it kind of shows we're, we're sort of tropical. Um, if I go back, there's some rocks, as you can see down there. There's, as a kid, that's where I spent sort of most of my, my days. As an undergraduate student, the university that I went to was just a small college in my hometown, which was about a 30 minute drive to the beach. So there were times where I was not in class, but more at the beach. Not such a great advertisement for encouraging people to come to class, but you know, when it's snowing outside in Michigan, why would you not come into class? Because there's nowhere else to go. Uh, okay, so that that's Australia for me. That's our our, our home where uh, we try to get to as frequently as possible. But it sits empty. This house sits empty for like 50 weeks of the year, which is a bit of a shame. Anyway. Um, but what do we do when we're in Michigan? So one of the things that I have been known to do is go ice climbing. Um, I think I've got a couple of photos here. Um, so there's a, a group of um, friends from church actually who are very much into ice climbing. And, and so we head up to the Upper Peninsula, colloquially known as the UP. Um, place called Munising and uh, Pictured Rocks and we look for frozen waterfalls and go, uh, go climbing. This particular picture, we had to trek across the frozen Lake Superior to get to these waterfalls and go climbing for the day and then trek back again across the frozen lake. Um, not the entire lake, of course, because it's a very big body of water, uh, just between the mainland and this island. Uh, really good climbing that we uh, were able to, to do. And I think the last, uh, no, the second last photo. So the other things that I enjoy are um, paragliding. So clearly uh, I've only been tandem flying. This is in Switzerland in Little Brennan Valley. But one of my goals for retirement is to learn to go para solo paragliding. Um, we'll see if my wife allows that, but uh, it is quite spectacular just kind of silently floating around. In this particular case, the, the face of uh, Iger, one of the large mountains in Switzerland, and just enjoying the view. So it's um, a good way to spend life between conferences. Uh, this was actually between two conferences uh, a couple of years back now. Um, Professor Iskins, we got a question. Yeah, okay. Um, where is your, um, where in Australia is your house on the beach? Okay, so um, the easiest way to describe that is uh, it's exactly, sits almost exactly on the Tropic of Capricorn. So, um, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, people kind of think of the Tropic of Cancer, right? It's at 23 and a half degrees. And um, so in the Southern Hemisphere, the Tropic of Capricorn, is exactly the latitude that our house sits on. It's at the intersection of the, the east coast of Australia and the Tropic of Capricorn. So that probably doesn't mean too much to people. Other places that sit exactly on the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil is um, right on the Tropic of Capricorn. So it's, it's, it's a tropical kind of place. So to put that into uh, kind of um, express that a different way, if you think of the 
east coast of Australia, it, it bends out to the east. If you think of the most easterly point on the east coast of Australia and go 500 miles further north from there, that's where you find our, uh, our house. So 800 kilometers. And if you think that's a long way, the, the area of this area of Australia is the same as the surface area of the lower 48 states in uh, the US. So it's not this little island that sits down in the Pacific, between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. It's actually quite a massive area. And, and so to, uh, to draw, when we fly into Australia, we typically fly into Brisbane, and then it's a 400 mile drive to where our, our house is. Uh, and you know, people just kind of fly in and drive 40 miles, maybe not the same day, but maybe the next day. So it's, you know, it's, it's, I think one gets used to traveling long distances. Okay, um, good question. I, um, it's, hopefully people can kind of visualize a little bit of Australia and just think of that most easterly point and, Travel 800 miles, or no, 800 kilometers, 500 miles north of it. Um, to, to, I guess, again, put it in context, to reach the tip of Australia from our place is another 2,000 kilometers or thereabouts. So we're not talking way up the top of Australia. Again, I'll emphasize it's a big country. The last um, photo that I want to show, and I'm sure there are other questions that people have that I should go back to as well. So I used to do a lot of sailing, so there's not that much uh, scope for sailing. There's a lot of lakes, but it's not quite a lot of ocean sailing. So I used to do a lot of sailing on catamaran, 14 foot catamaran, which the class was uh, not a hobby. It was an arrow class. So Similar size to a Hobby 14, but much faster than Hobby 14. So the, the boat weighed one of those boats that you can see on the, in the picture there. Let me get a little bit bigger. So one of those boats weighs 50 kilograms, 110 pounds, the, the whole boat, and uh, absolutely flies across the surface of the water. Um, until things like you can see in the screen happen, which does happen at Cape Town. So notice by the you sail into a wave and the, the boat stops, the front of the boat stops and the rest of the boat keeps on going. So this is, you kind of look at this picture, and that's not me by the way, um, but it turns out this is sort of, there's a good story here because this was the first each first race of the Australian National Championship titles. And this guy ditched it, as you can see, there's no recovery from that particular position. You go upside down and then right the boat and continue on. Um, so he didn't do particularly well in that first heat, but then the, the, um, the, the regatta consists of nine, nine heats. Um, and of which you drop two of those. So he went on to basically win all the other eight heats and won the national championship. And so there's sort of a message there that even when things are not going well, even when you're kind of like about to capsize and life is not looking good, that there's, you know, that doesn't mean it's the end of the story. You know, one can persevere through these things. I can tell you from experience when this type of thing happens, it hurts because there's only one place that you're going to go typically, and that's to hit some lump of aluminium on the way into the water. And that leaves quite a bruise and sometimes blood and it's not pleasant. Um, but you right the boat and you sail on. And you know, in this case, in the next few races, you won those races and 
won the championship. So, yeah, there's a message of uh, when things don't all go well, uh, pick yourself up and refocus and move on kind of thing. Um, we got an, we got another question, Professor Hiskins. Um, yeah. It says, um, do you enjoy the Great Lakes here in Michigan? Yeah, we do. So um, for those who are not so aware of where Ann Arbor is, uh, from, from here to Lake Michigan shoreline is about a two and a half hour drive, depending on which part of the shoreline. So the closest part is about two and a half hours. And they're really spectacular. Um, it's almost like being at the ocean, but the waves are not quite the same. They're steeper waves than ocean waves. Um, but it, it's kind of colder in winter as well. But I've never been sailing. I've, I've been paddle boarding and a few things like that over on, uh, on Lake Michigan. Uh, and, it, and it's really very pleasant. It, the water temperature can be a little cool sometimes, but at other times it's really very pleasant. Uh, and there's a, a number of spectacular spots all up and down the Lake Michigan and shore. One of our favorites is Sleeping Bear Dunes, these massive sand dunes um, right next to the, the lake and look out across the lake. It's just really spectacular. So that's where we've been a, a, a fair, spend a reasonable amount of that time. Um, not a whole lot, but, but we certainly like getting over there. We haven't spent so much time on the other lakes. Uh, uh, lake Superior, I think it's a winter time you walk on, but we were there the one time in there during the summer. It is absolutely freezing the water in the summer. It's kind of the best ankle take in the middle of summer. Um, but I haven't been swimming in Lake Superior. I've been walking on top of Lake Superior. Any other questions? Or... Yes. yes. Um, we had a question about uh, your research. Yeah, OK. Yep. That's what kind of Yep. What made you interested in power and energy? Yeah, so that, that's really an interesting background. So my dad worked in the local distribution utility as an accountant. So he was on the, you know, the other side of the industry dealing with the dollars and cents and so forth. Um, so let me unshare... Am I still sharing the screen? I just got it. Yep. You're good to go. Yeah. Okay. So you, you got rid of the photo. So you, you're looking at me now? Yep. We're looking at, um, we just see you right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think the, the photo of sailing boats is better. But anyway. Um, so my dad worked in the electricity uh, distribution utility. Uh, on the accounting side, he said, engineers get paid more than accountants, so you should be an electrical engineer. Uh, and um, I wanted to be a mathematician, but math mathematicians don't get paid very well. Um, and electrical engineers get paid a bit better. So off I went to do a, um, electrical engineering. And in, in so doing, um, of course, there's a lot of math involved in engineering. Did some math courses, really enjoyed those. So I ended up doing a, a, a double degree. Um, back then, so now doing dual degrees is kind of routine almost. Um, lots of people do that. But back then it wasn't the case. And so the little university that I went to didn't know how to deal with someone who was doing two degrees at the one time. So I actually had two student cards and two um, different ID numbers my electrical engineering degree and for my mathematics degree. And invariably during the exam period, there'd be clashes because no one else was doing this set of subjects. Uh, so we'd work through those kinds of things. Um, students these days get, seem to get upset if they have like two, two, two hour exams back to back. I can remember having four three-hour exams back to back. Uh, exams when I was a student were typically three hours each. 
And I remember having one on the, and, and there was an exam in the morning and an exam in the afternoon. And I had one on an afternoon, one the next morning, one the next afternoon, and one the next morning. And uh, if your brain wasn't fried by the end of that, uh, then clearly you were doing better than me. And one of my other interesting exam moments was uh, sitting in exam and thinking, wow, it's, smells like there's smoke around and hearing fire engines. And it turns out that the church across the street from where the exam was being held was burning down and I'd parked my car in the grounds of the church. So in the middle of the exam, I was allowed out to go and move my car from the fire um, and then back to the exam. So who knows how my results went, but anyway, that's life. Okay, I have another question. Um, how do you find students to work with you? Yeah, okay. So there's different processes for different levels of students. Um, so for, for PhD students, you know, we receive a lot of applicants. Um, and then through, uh, typically through early January before classes start, late December, early January, it's a matter of going through and looking for the students who in their applications uh, indicate that they would be a good match for the research that I'm working on. And then it's a matter of filtering, right? So there's way too many of those. And then it, there's phone interviews and, um, and, and uh, talking with students and interacting and trying to get a good feel for who would be a good match and, and whose interests um, are not. Yeah, one, one of the things that uh, I find a lot is uh, with a lot of students have good industry background, good knowledge of how power systems engineering works. But what my, my research sits at the interface between the power systems activities and the mathematics side of things. And so it's finding students who can bridge that um, boundary between understanding the electrical engineering, understanding the power systems concepts and the sort of the reality of what the, what power systems mean uh, you know, in, in a true operational sense, but then being comfortable with the mathematics as well. Because a lot of what we do is delving into mathematical theories to help understand why power systems and other systems behave as they do. So I'll, I'll kind of link back. My, my research is power systems, but what I like doing, I'm the sort of engineer that likes pulling things apart, and working out how they behave and why they behave in the way that they do. So when you're dealing with power systems or systems in general, it's different to a piece of equipment. A piece of equipment, you can you know, physically unbolt bits, pull it apart, understand what's going on there. In, in systems, power systems, it's about trying to delve into, you, know, you have this mathematical monster that you can observe certain forms of behavior and it's about seeking to discover what causing those forms of behavior. What is it? What are the interactions that are making the system operate in a particular way? Because often you know, there's undesirable forms of behavior. So you want to be able to identify what's causing that so that you can rectify that in some way, design a new, new control loop or tune up an existing control loop to provide better performance. And, and so a lot of it is what's causing the problem so that I can now sort of address the right problem rather than putting patches on problems saying, well, this is happening, therefore we'll patch it with this. What I try to do through a mathematical, using mathematical tools is understand the root cause. And then having understood that root cause to be able to identify a mechanism for addressing that root cause. So that's kind of the, 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 the overall picture, but mathematics plays an important part of that process. 
Another question came through. Um, on that point, are there math classes outside of Calc Sequence for undergraduates who are interested in power systems that you recommend? Uh, so, a so there's different levels of that. So one of the things that is really useful is having a good grasp of numerical techniques. And having having said we you know, we deal with a whole lot of uh, dealing with the math. Ultimately, what you're observing is uh, a, a numerical approximation of how a system would actually behave. Because you know, we, we build these mathematical models and those mathematical models have to be solved in some way. They're nonlinear, typically nonlinear. So um, it, it's about how to deal with the numerics of making sure what you observe in your simulation matches how the model would truly behave and then developing the, developing the model so it matches how the real system would behave. So looking at numerical courses so that you can get a good feel for when things like a simulation might break down or under what conditions it might break down or being able to tune a numerical algorithm to ensure that you're getting a certain level of accuracy is a, a, an important starting point. But beyond that, um, the tools that we certainly use build on calculus, both in terms of looking at the dynamic behavior of power systems, which can be modeled as uh, this interaction, the switched interaction of differential algebraic systems through to looking at optimization um, algorithms and wanting to be able to address issues arising from nonlinear, non-convex problems. There, there's a lot of the calculus and then sort of building on the calculus to metric spaces and so forth that, that um, underpin those ideas as well. So, um, you know, pathways through numerical analysis, pathways through optimization, pathways through functional analysis, uh, all of these things can be kind of important. The, but the important thing is that you want to enjoy this, these ideas as well. So, you know, it's no, no, no use heading off and sort of on a, a pathway towards optimization if it's not an area that you think is sort of fun and interesting and, and enjoy the outcomes. Ultimately, it's about enjoying what you're working on. Thank you so much. Um, here's another question. Um, how do you prefer students or postdocs to approach you about possible research? So um, given the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment with isolating, email is really the only way of, uh, of, of approaching. So, um, but having, having said that, I get a gazillion emails and um, it's almost impossible. If, if one wants to get anything else done, it's almost impossible to keep up with email. So the, the best approach is sort of this dripping tap approach that if you email me and you don't get a response, maybe a week or so later, it may be worth sending another reminder email or something like that. But email is the, the um, most effective way. And then assuming we eventually do move back onto campus, then if, you know, when, when we interact through email, if there's, uh, looks like there's a good uh, synergy of ideas, and then there'll be, you know, I'll, we'll make time to, to meet, set up an appointment to meet and chat about things. Um, so, you know, there's, um, email is the sort of the entrance point. I, I, I got sidetracked. So we were talking about how, um, you know, how do I choose students? And really, I talked about PhD. In terms of master's students and undergraduate students, it's really the first point of entrance, if you like, in that, in that setting, it's getting to know the students through class and um, just seeing what they, how they perform, what, the, what interests them, um, 
uh, students who come along to office hours who are certainly you know interested in in uh, us or have questions relating to homeworks and lectures but then have questions that go beyond that so it's this inquisitiveness that is vitally important research is all about being inquisitive asking the question why why does it behave like that why you know, why can't we make things better you know, just asking those kind of questions for me that is a really important characteristic that, that, that i look for in students that they're not just going to you know what what doesn't get me excited is students who come along you give them a task they come back a week later they've done that task and they ask what do i do next what does get me excited is they come back and they say hey i did this and it it gave this unusual result so i thought about that maybe this is what's going on and then then you can talk about that a little bit more and sort of push a little, you know, why would you think that? Yeah, that really does make sense. Hey, that's really cool. Maybe we can investigate that a little bit further. So, you know, what, what I'm looking for in students is that value added that they, ev everyone at Michigan's smart, right? They can all, everyone can do the work, but there's those students who can do the work and then ask the question, well, I did this and it led to this, I did that. and and now I don't quite understand what's going on there. I think this is what's going on, but what do you think? You know, it's that interaction that is the most fulfilling part of research. Um, and, and that's what I'm looking for. So, you know, I gave a talk just the other day and, you know, the question that was posed was, what's, what have I found the most surprising thing through my career? And the most surprising thing was going way back to the very early stages of my PhD when I was a student doing PhD and just uh, discovering the joy of discovery. I can still remember sitting in a seminar. I had obtained some results, which I thought must have been due to a bug in the code that I'd written. And I was sitting in a seminar, I have no idea what the seminar was about, because I was thinking through these results, trying to make some sense of what I had observed. And it suddenly clicked what probably was the, the, causing these unusual results. And so after the seminar, I raced back and explored this a little bit further. And sure enough, that was what was going on. And, that changed the entire course of my PhD, um, opened up a whole new area that no one had thought about before. And, um, and, it, and it just came from being inquisitive of sort of seeing something that was unusual and thinking about it, thinking about it, not being able to leave it alone. That's what I'm looking for, um, that's, Obviously, I'm looking for clones of me, right? Um, maybe not. But, but it's that level of inquisitiveness that I think is really important. Everyone's smart, but being able to take that in you know, a different direction. So, you know, I was talking with a collaborator yesterday over Zoom. Collaborator, collaborator is at a university in Australia. And we've been doing some work on some stuff. And... And you know, I have been stuck on a particular problem. And she says, but what if we did it this way? It's like, that's so clean and so obvious. And then I spent the rest of the day um, feeling really bad because I hadn't thought of that first. So there's a competitiveness in, in all of us, right? And uh, you know, it's, a, it's a great idea that we will explore further. And it's, you know, it's really nice that this, my, young collaborator um, thought of it and it's, I'm really grumpy that I didn't but that's life um, 
so we'll we'll take that some some distance further. But it's that kind of interaction where you're talking about stuff. You you might be stuck on a problem and you're just bouncing these ideas around, and suddenly there's the genesis of an idea comes from that. That's what is exciting about research. That's what keeps me motivated. It's not dealing with 100 emails a day. It's these sparks of new ideas that can then get fleshed out and have an impact. Maybe have an impact. Thank you so much. Um, we had another question. Um, do you have any tips for international students to help them with their transition to new culture, new campus, and possibly new language? Uh, yeah, so I guess, yeah, you know, being Australian, when we moved to the US, we had to learn sort of half of a new language, kind of. Um, there were words that we would uh, use from Australian that no one had any idea what we were talking about, and I probably still do use that. But it is different. Um, and uh, I, I don't, it, it's, a, it's about assimilating, like there's not very many Australians around Ann Arbor. We occasionally might bump into someone, um, but not very many. And so it's not like we're sort of hanging out with the Australian crowd or anything like that. But for us, I mentioned earlier, you know, we attend a local church and that provides an opportunity to you know, get to meet the local people, people who have lived in the Ann Arbor area all their lives or at least a significant proportion of it. And they share their um, enthusiasm for the area. And for, you know, there's always this homesickness. You know, we, I, like I mentioned before, dream about looking out over the ocean and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's natural. Um, but it, it's about kind of linking as well. But, you know, having said all of that, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the classic introvert. So, you know, it's not that, for me, it's not important to have lots of social contact. It's important to kind of discover the area and to start to feel some level of ownership in that, in a sense of, you know, this is where we are, this is who we are, um, it, you know, it shapes who you are. That doesn't mean that you, the background is any less important, but it's about sort of adding new features to life, uh, not discarding the old ones, but being willing to adopt new aspects of culture um, and, and you know, new ways of doing things and new ways of thinking about things. I will say that there are some aspects of life in the US and ways of thinking about things that uh, never cease to surprise us, let's just put it that way. Um, but uh, we, we carry with us in an Australian lens on looking at things that happen uh, and we enjoy and we like learning and we explore um, and we try to understand and I think that's an important part of that. wanting to know what people understanding the way people think and why they think that way you mightn't agree with the way they think about it but at least understanding where they're coming from is a really important aspect Thank you so much. In terms of the whole immigration thing, uh, you know, it's, um, it's yeah, moving to the US, we went through initially a J visa, then an H visa and the green card. And by the time we'd finished that, the US immigration had sucked all our money out of us and we had nothing left to, to uh, keep going. Anyway, no, not, not totally, but it is quite a harrowing experience at times when you're putting, in our case, seven people, our five kids and my wife and I, through the green card process. Um, it's interesting. One, one interesting experience from that was that we, uh, my wife and I couldn't find our records from our childhood where we had, I think the measles injection, I can't remember exactly which Im uh, immunization it was. So we had to line up at the local clinic and there's these mums with all their little one-year-old kids and stuff. And 
the nurse looks at us and looks around for the kids and it's like, no, no, it's us who has to get this, uh, this uh, injection because we have to be able to show the authorities that we've done it. It's a fun experience. Thank you. Um, and then we had a question that says, what is the most interesting or memorable experience that you've, you have had at the University of Michigan? Um, summer is always a memorable experience. No, I, I guess the, so in, so I was a faculty member at the University of Newcastle in Australia, and then at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and then at University of Wisconsin in Madison before moving to Michigan. So I've sort of done this tour of the Big Ten in the Midwest, in, the, in a sense. Um, so the most memorable thing, or the thing that impacted me most about Michigan was the level of two aspects, the level of resources to enable faculty to operate at their most effective was impressive. Um, it, it's, um, yeah, the university really takes the view that faculty are the best in the world at what they do. So let's support them as best we can to do what they do, rather than having them, you know, waste their precious time on other things, admin, admin things or, or whatever that someone else could uh, look after for them. So, so that's you know, been really uh, helped me to be very, very much more productive. And that's been you know, one of the most memorable aspects of uh, being at the University of Michigan. And, you know, I know that my grad students benefit from that level of support, administrative support as well. The, the other thing that really has impacted me that you know, is unique in my experience is the, the sort of the level of multidisciplinary interactions that occur across campus. And um, so, so again, I had have experience from a number of previous universities, but Michigan has been unique in that uh, in that way of uh, of just opportunities to interact with uh, with other people. Um, bringing ideas from their background together, you know, my background and, and other things. And uh, there, you know, there's, there's stacks of opportunities to, to work with others. And in working with others, you start to appreciate you know, that, that their topic, what they bring to that topic, and, and things blossom out of that a lot. Uh, and you know, sometimes it's maybe not direct faculty to faculty contact, but a grad student does a course in, in IOE on optimization, for example. And out of that, they come back with some ideas. And then you, know, you talk with the, the student, talks with the faculty member, talks with me, and you, know, you develop a new project maybe out of some idea that originated out of uh, some coursework. But you know, the multidisciplinary nature of uh, life at Michigan has been, been unique and has been really very stimulating. Thank you so much. And I think we have time for one last question. Um, it is, how do you see the field of power and energy advancing, especially as climate change worsens? Yeah, so that's a, you know, uh, that's a topical question. It's a really good question. The, there's uh, enormously fast movement towards renewable generation. Uh, and I think particularly in Australia, well, I think particularly of Australia, because it's a climate that is conducive to a lot of solar, uh, solar energy production over almost the entire continent. And then across the lower part of the continent, there's the roaring 40s. I think that's what the winds are called. Anyway, a lot of wind power across the lower part. Um, in the US, there's an enormous amount of wind generation down the middle and then in other parts of the country. Solar is very important in the um, southwest and then you know, across the south. But Michigan, you know, solar is not so good. Anyway, this is developing and nothing's going to slow that process. So what's the important aspect? There's really sort of uh, there are two aspects that are vitally important for the future. 
One is optimal operation, taking into account the variability of renewable generation. So you have to be able to operate, ensure that the loads continue to be satisfied, even if there's some weather change that comes through and then wind turbines go from maximum production to zero production, for example. Um, so operating power systems becomes very intimately tied up with weather forecasting and predictive capability that comes from that, predicting what the weather's gonna do, predicting what loads are going to do, and then matching those up to um, be able to best meet the needs in, a, in an optimal sense um, from the available renewable generation. So that's one aspect and it's receiving an enormous amount of attention. That I was, just before this, I was on a, a Zoom link to a conference that's be happening in Portugal that's now virtual. And that the whole session was associated with that particular aspect. Um, the other aspect that I see is really fundamentally important is understanding the dynamic behavior induced by large amounts of power electronic converter-based uh, converter generation. So power systems have traditionally been dominated by synchronous machines, coal-fired, nuclear-powered, hydro, all synchronous machines, gas synchronous machines. And the physics of synchronous machines are well understood and lead to a fairly benign form of behavior most of the time for power systems. So now those synchronous machines are being phased out in favor of instead of you know, one large 350 megawatt synchronous machine, that might be replaced by thousands of rooftop solar panels. And they're spread all you know, geographically diversely across a large area. And there's no control, no direct control available anymore of that output. So there's dynamics associated with the interface of those pieces of equipment, the converters, the power electronics converters that are, that are converting between the DC of the panel and the AC of the grid have their own control loops. And there have been situations where a wind farm will interact with a solar farm because of the control loops, whilst what the designer, what the company, the manufacturer did was they designed their control loops in an ideal situation, but now that wind farm is operating in a non-ideal situation. So there's interactions happening between different devices that were never contemplated during the initial design phase. And so you get these oscillations or other forms of instabilities occurring on a local level, which is causing these devices, solar farms to trip offline for no apparent reason. And then when one starts to investigate, you find these interactions happening. And then it's a matter of, well, how do I deal with that? We're now looking at multiple manufacturers to designing their control loops in different ways that impact on the grid in unusual ways. How does one deal with those sorts of situations? And that's gonna become more and more prevalent as there's more and more solar power. Uh, solar and wind power uh, become available. And, and so that's the future, I think, uh, is dealing with those types of issues. And it's a really interesting problem because it's right at the interface between power systems and power electronics. So you have to understand the systems, the power system side of things, but you also have to know how the power electronic converters are operating and what's important about those operations in, in the sense of how they impact the grid. What's important about the grid in the sense of how it impacts on the power electronics. So it's really about bringing together skill bases from the power electronics and power systems community to be able to develop models that enable the proper level of investigation, all in the midst of uh, manufacturers not wanting to reveal what the details are of their control loops within their devices. Synchronous machines are physics-based devices. There's nothing about a synchronous machine that you can't learn by doing some testing. But the power electronic converters are much more 
complicated in the sense that there's a manufacturer has designed into that converter certain characteristics that might be quite hard to reveal from, from the limited testing that you can do in a black box sense. You're not allowed to know what's inside the converter, so you only can monitor what's happening on the outside, and that might not be sufficient to reveal all the details that you need to know. So there's, there's, inter there's a lot of interesting work to be done in that field. And it, this is imp important because practitioners, the electrical engineers in the power systems world out there and the utilities are really struggling at the moment to be able to assess the viability of new wind farms, new solar farms and things like that. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Hiskins for answering all your questions and kind of um, being a part of our first coffee and conversations event. Um, we're so happy to have you and we're so happy to have um, everyone participate today. And um, we look forward to hopefully doing this again soon. Um, so I hope everyone has a great afternoon and thank you all so much. And, and thanks Sylvia for organizing all of this as well. And I still don't know how come I ended up first, but I'll get even <laughs> at some point. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, it was fantastic. You did a great job. I appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.